Whelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Now providing live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service at their chapel in Rock Island. Getting ready for Mr. Thanksgiving's holiday feast, and it will not be like any held in the past. Plus, a perspective on the cities from a guy who for years helped us look at ourselves in the cities. We mark the 10th anniversary of our program, The Cities, with an interview with a person that was on our very first program. It was late November, a pivotal election had just finished up, and we were looking forward to Thanksgiving and the holiday season. Well, this year, Bob Vogelbaugh will be serving his holiday dinner for one and all for the 50th time. But he doesn't want to call it the 50th anniversary. We'll talk about that. What does he really want to accomplish today? And what gives with a pandemic? How do you hold a major dinner like that? We talked with Mr. Thanksgiving, Bob Vogelbaugh. Thanksgiving's going to be different this year. I mean, how did you have to work forward to this day? Well, as soon as this uh, broke out and knowing as it was progressing, progressing, I thought, okay, we're going to do something. And in my little uh, brain that I have, I thought we, we can do a drive-by. And that's why I'm not really calling it the 50th year, which was supposed to have been the 50th in the golden year, but I'm calling it the 50, 49 and a half year. <laughs> and so I think this is going to be one of my biggest uh, dinners ever. By pure size. Yeah. And luckily you're at South Park Mall. There's, there's a parking lot available for you to take care of all these people. Well, yeah, they, uh, the whole mall for the first time in many years is not opening at all on Thanksgiving Day, and not because of my dinner, but I think uh, God bless uh, merchants for being closed so people can be with their families. Right. You know, I mean, but anyhow, no, we're going to just have to be directing the traffic to come up uh, by Vamar there in that hall, and then there will be pe uh, people out there asking how many do you need, and then they will bring it out to you. No one gets out of their vehicles, not even on the bus. Metrolink will be filling up the bus and uh, bringing people out, and then uh, we'll go on and say, how many do you need, how many do you, in that way, so. The real big loss this year is that sense of community, and right. that was so important to you, is to bring people together for that one big meal, that that's the big that's the yeah. Big that's loss. the saddest thing yeah. because you know many times out there there would be just husband and wife because their families were somewhere else in the country or whatever, or you know it was just like it was more like a party because I used to have a a live band then I went to a DJ so and none of that this year and you know and then it was it was a sit down dinner, uh, you didn't go through the line your food was brought to you and everything. Well, it will be in a yeah. box this year. In a very different way, yeah. yeah. Well, what about donations? I mean, each year you've asked for donations. I mean, does this now cost you less, or is this actually more expensive? It's more expensive this year. I would think so, and, because you now have to supply the right. plastic, all of that stuff that, that uh, right. is involved in a portable meal. And I'm hiring the hy V people to do it. I mean, not to cook it, but to dish it up and everything. And uh, yeah, and donations are way down because I don't think people are thinking Thanksgiving yet or it's got in their mind that this dinner's still going. But it is. But it is. How important is it that it did be, how important was it for it to be held this year? I think it's more important, every year is important, but I think this year most of all it's important because I have gotten some notes from uh, people uh, with a donation, you know, uh, we're, not, we're unable to go uh, to be with our family uh, for a large gathering, so they're going to be coming out and you know picking up and stuff like that. So I think it's very important, uh, with, and also with people being laid off or cut back, uh, you know, the need is there whether people want to uh, realize it or not. But that was never really the full point of your Thanksgiving dinner. Was no, for, for for needy people. So it's, to speak. Ne it's never been a charity dinner, and this year it's not a charity dinner. It's a gathering of pilgrims and in Indians for the first time, and uh, that's what it's all about. No, I get so tired after Thanksgiving when it was the sit down. I'd hear people say, "Oh, 
I saw so-and-so out there. They have more money than you could imagine. I said, mm -hmm. well, good for them. I have said, You've got, you don't even know then what the dinner's about. It's, right. it's a big community dinner of all walks of life. For people who don't know or, or don't remember the story, this started 50 years ago. Correct. Why? I own a little mom and pop's grocery store not far from here on 12th Street. And there was a grocery out front, living quarters in the back. But I didn't live there because I was open six days a week. And I could have lived there and saved rent money, but I thought, I can imagine Sunday afternoon, about four o'clock, there'd be a knock on the door. Uh, can we get a loaf of bread or a quarter of milk? And I thought, I'm not gonna get away from the business. So anyhow, primarily maybe, maybe two weeks before Thanksgiving, primarily my mature customers, I don't use OLD, that's me. I say mature, but anyhow, sure. uh, my elderly customers, what are you gonna be doing for the upcoming holiday? And it was almost a unison answer, on just another day to be alone. Mm -hmm. And then a 20 watt bulb went off in my head and thought, well, why should this be? I've got these rooms. I can get card tables and chairs and I'm going to, and I got a walk-in cooler. I got a stove. I'm going to do a Thanksgiving dinner here. Well, when I started asking them, they were kind of reluctant. Well, why are you really doing this? Do we have right. to buy all our groceries from you? And I said, absolutely not. Right. I want to get the feeling of the first Thanksgiving. I don't think you're going to know it each other, you could and that'd be fine, but I wanna, it's just like gathering pilgrims and Indians for the first time. And there, and because of one lady, her name was Rose Hansen, that we're going into the actually 50th year, but she would come to my store in a cab and then my butcher would take her home. And she never bought that much from me. And I said, I can't compete with a supermarket, but you pay to uh, come here in a cab. And she said, that, with the parish bowl, she said, well, my stove is a hot plate and my refrigerator is my window seal. And I thought, oh my God, no wonder she doesn't buy that much right. parish bowl stuff. Anyhow, when we, the first Thanksgiving, when we were getting to t uh, ready to take everybody home, she grabbed, came up and grabbed my hand and she said, I want to thank you for the delicious meal I had, but what I want to thank you most of all for is the fellowship and friendship that I haven't had in years. And back then I didn't generally look at the, uh, the obituaries in the paper. Well, every morning I get, when I get up, I get my paper. Okay, I'm not in there. That means <laughs> I got to get dressed and go be a school crossing guard. But for some reason, uh, it was right before Christmas that year, um, picked, I got home one night from the store about nine o'clock and at the, in the obituaries was Rose Hansen uh, 89, she was going to be buried. Her s service was going to be the next day at Estradal Funeral Home. At that time was downtown Moline, a uh, half a block from my store. So I quick ran over there and, and to see her. Well, when you go to all these visitations and you see all these massive flowers, I think what something could be done for a charity. Right. Well, Rose had none, but she did have flowers for her. Uh, I made sure she had flowers for her service. And I thought, you know, there's a lot more Rose Hansons out there, there are. that do not come to my grocery store. And because of Rose Hanson, that's why we're actually going into the 50th. Well, and you have uh, the Rose Hansons of the world who have said thank you to you in particular. But you must hear these stories, as you said, or get these moments of thank you time and time again, which is worth more than anything else. Oh, yeah. It would you get from that money can't buy, whether people believe me or not. I mean, it. Uh, uh, you know you're helping somebody not to be alone on a holiday or, you know, or to be with a, a, bunch, a lot of other people, you know what I'm saying? And uh, this, all the money in the world can't replace the feeling I have on Thanksgiving Day. Every year you must look back and go, that was an accomplishment, we got that one done. Now you look back at 50 years of doing this, and it's an amazing accomplishment, isn't it? It's because of everybody that, I have two key volunteers, Vicki Burtsell Baker has been with me forever, and Connie McAuley, uh, the administrative assistant from South Park Mall. I can't give those two ladies enough credit, uh, and so many other volunteers that, but it's just amazing how people want to help, and, you know, they're the ones that are making it. Surely I'm, when the dinner starts, I'm not being humble or modest. 
I let everybody else take over. I mm -hmm. will walk down the mall away from the dinner because I don't. I I've had enough of with the media being on me. I now I want it on everybody else. What can people expect on this particular Thanksgiving dinner? I mean, how how do people? Do you just show up? What what do you want people to do? When all you have to do is stay in your car, drive up. You'll see where it's, we're going to have signs and people directing traffic out there at South Park. It's going to be down uh, by where the food bank is, uh, down by Vamar in that hall. But you just stay in your vehicle. Uh, someone will come out. How many dinners do you need? They will go in and say, we need four or five whatever dinners. Then that's taken back out to the car and handed through the window. And then they have to drive on then. When does planning for 50 and a half, let's say, or the 50th start? I mean, next year's project hopefully will be back to normal. I sure hope so. I mean, you know, uh, I would like to, uh, you know, end the 50th next year uh, without COVA, you know. So I'm just, you know, uh, you just got to take one day at a time. You never know what's going to happen. But 50 next year... The unofficial, well, actually, that's the official 50. The, Somewhat, the, some the, people yeah. might say the 51st. Yeah, I know they, they will. I know some people have had a hard time for me to call 49 and a half, but I've said <laughs> the 50th was supposed to be the golden year. There's right. nothing golden about this year. But it must be that you really want to do something special for the number 50. Oh, yes. Yeah. One thing I would like to uh, have, uh, if she would come, and she probably wouldn't, was Ellen DeGeneres just shock everybody that she would because you know you can talk about it Jim um, and, and I tell people you know you just and not, nothing against the media TV or radio or anything else but I said you just need to come down there when it's going on to see the love that's projected by everybody down there from the diners to the servers to everybody it's, it's not I'm not being humble again it's not just me it's everybody and there's no one more job that's important than, than anything else. It takes all this to make it go. Bob Volkebaugh, Mr. Thanksgiving. And once again, his Thanksgiving drive through dinner will be held outside of Moline's South Park Mall on Thanksgiving afternoon. In a moment, looking at the cities with columnist John Marks. But first, enjoying the cities with Laura Adams, who's ready to go out and about. This is Out and About through November 30th. This year's Festival of Trees looks different. Join them on KWQC the 21st at 10 or visit their pop-up gift shop and window display November 21st through 29th at Quad City Arts in Rock Island. Celebrate Thanksgiving early with a virtual Kids in the Kitchen class November 25th from 10 to 11. Be sure to register at High V. Register for WQPT's online screening of The Gene and Intimate History and a discussion with the film's director November 19th at 6.30. The Figgy Art Museum showcases their Haitian masterworks through January 24th, while the Smith Studio and Gallery in Geneseo present paintings by Pat Bradley Bearskin through the 28th. The 2020 Gone Farm and Fall Premier Auction takes place the 19th through the 21st at the Mississippi Valley Fairgrounds, and there's music at Rhythm City. Frank Martin Bush, the 20th, Tightrope, the 25th, and soul blues legend Johnny Rawls, the 27th. A handwritten copy of Abraham Lincoln's most famous speech, the Gettysburg Address, will be on display at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library through November 30th, and prepare for the holidays by attending Yule Marknod or Christmas Market in Bishop Hill, November 27th through December 6th. Check out the holiday lights at February, November 28th through January 3rd, while the Quad City Botanical Center's Winter Nights Winter Lights exhibit runs through January 10th. For more information, visit wqpt.org. We're still waiting for the day when musicians can actually perform in front of packed venues in the cities. Well, that's not happening anytime soon, it seems. In the meantime, we're featuring some of the musicians who came here to the Black Box Theater to share their talents with you. And that includes Jonathan Turner, who performed for us his original Midwest Boy. Just a Midwest boy, I 
and a Jersey girl Alone in New York Alone in the world Night after night the boy and girl wondered If they'd ever find the one Or would their hungry hearts be forever born to run They thought, where are you? Just a Midwest boy and a Jersey girl. One day they met online. They let their feelings unfurl. With the touch of a mouse, they clicked. Got together the very next day. The date she was born, on their date she was reborn to stay. I found you That's Jonathan Turner and Midwest Boy. He performed here at the Black Box Theater in downtown Moline. For 25 years, Jonathan Turner was a reporter for the Dispatch Argus, covering the art scene as well as the comings and goings throughout the Quad City area. And for 35 years, his colleague, John Marks, did the same. But in September, John Marks decided to retire. He's still going to write columns twice a month for the Dispatch Argus and the Quad City Times. Things have changed in the 35 years when he first picked up a pen and paper and started covering this area. What does he see now as we look back and forward with John Marks? So tell me about the 35 years. I mean, looking back, it went like a flash. It really did. Um, I started as a part-time sports writer just across the street here um, uh, at the dispatch, uh, it, but they were in need of a full-timer soon. Um, so I, I got that opportunity. First started with the Argus in 85. And then the dispatch purchased the Argus in 19, uh, January 1, 1986. Uh, I came to this building across the street. Um, it didn't last long for me as a part-timer. I, I, I moved into a full-time uh, spot really quick and covered sports for seven years. And, and somebody you probably remember when you first time, Murray Hurt was the, was the paper's columnist and a legend and somebody I grew up reading. And Jimmy, somebody I looked up to. And uh, um, he was taken ill. And uh, Mr. Small, who owned the paper, and Mr. Taylor, um, the world's best publisher, um, cornered me one morning and said, hey, um, Murray has, has given the blessing. If you would like to take over his, you don't take over anything. You know what it's right. like. I sat in his chair for a while. And uh, 
Um, that was the transition. It, it was really hard at first because I was Murray Hurt, mm -hmm. and I'm Johnny Marks, the sports writer, and what am I doing occupying his space and his time and, and three columns a week? So um, it, was, it, was, it was really hard at first, but when you start writing about, and you know this, Jimmy, is if you start writing about people enough, um, they kind of draw to you. Is that the key? Because, yeah. I mean, you really like to show profiles. You, you're yep. such a great profile writer. Still are. I, I apologize for using no, past that's tense. that's okay. But, but it, it, the profiles is what really drove you. Yep. A long time ago, someone said, hey, you know how to spin a yarn, to me, about people. Yep. And you can tell a story. And I always thought, and, and a really, really wise man, Mr. Taylor, said, someone needs to have something positive written about them before their obituary. Now think about that. Um, somebody does something good, tell the world, it doesn't hurt. Um, are, are those pages and, or is that online or is your newscast, Jimmy, um, filled every day with some tough stuff you really don't want? You have to report, but you really don't want to? Yeah, and is it, do you get often enough the opportunity to tell a nice story about somebody? Not really. Well, that's one of the things that uh, uh, they endeared me to and uh, thought that I could do and, and that's, it was really centered around that for the 35, still is. And uh, I'd rather be able to tell a nice story than take somebody to task. Yeah, well, I mean, I was told by a news director that a newscast should reflect your day. You had good points, bad points, yeah. points that you needed to know but weren't that important. But how, how special is it to put basically the frosting on the cake of a newspaper by doing the positive profile stories? Well, you, you, I really, again, I don't want to get back to too many cliches about the honey and, and uh, you know, how you gravitate. But if you tell something good about somebody that might, A, endear them to, to we're no longer separate entities anymore, Jimmy. We're, we're always locked together as the media, mm -hmm. and we're the bad guys. Well, if, if you tell something that's, that's positive or tell a story of something doing good or someone doing good, then you might get somebody to soften their stance with one side or the other and you won't be lumped in as the media and you can't trust them. I always, I always take great offense to that. You, know, you never spent 10 minutes with me and what I did while you're lumping me together with, with a group of people that, you know, that do certain things or do things a different way. So that was neat. I, I still like telling the story. It was the greatest part of my freedom three times a week. And then I could write a feature story as well. That, that was the, the caveat to it all. I was in the features department. So on top of what I, what I wrote, uh, I, I got to write profiles on people uh, and mix my column into that. Yeah, that, that, it's, it's a great deal of fun. People always ask me, oh, who, tell me somebody that you interviewed, like a famous person that you've been able to oh interview. Yeah, but I mean, the best interviews weren't those. No, the absolutely. ones that you remember are not those great point. interviews. Yep. The, the, well, okay, uh, I had a great time with the Blue Angels, but I had more fun with their ground guy <laughs> who was, you know, wiping down the, the plane, uh, tightening the bolts and making sure that thing flew the next day. Um, I, we, you understand this because of your political work. Um, I've had a meal or a breakfast or been in the same room with five presidents. I'd rather talk to the high school senior that did his service project to, be, to, get, his, uh, uh, to get the top award as a Boy Scout. I would rather, an Eagle Scout thing would mean a whole lot more to me. Or the guy that, or Bob Vogelbaugh, since you, since you bring him, uh, I'd rather spend 10 minutes with, with Bob and what it was like to feed 3,200 people uh, every Thanksgiving than I would uh, a presidential candidate. And, and some of the athlete, athletes, you know, you find out 99.9% of those guys are great guys. And then there's the Albert Bells of this world. So, but that, there's always one. But 90, again, as I said, most everybody was, was gracious. Your other love, of course, is sports and sports reporting, and you've been doing it for more than 30 years. Have you noticed a change in sports? Uh, I, I, yes. Um, a, the attitude. Um, That's where I was going to get. Dollar-driven, um, specialized. Metrics are the, um, you no, no longer judge. You're judged by launch angle, uh, exit velocity, uh, spin rate on a breaking ball. You're judged by your 40 time and not your heart in football. Um, basketball, you're judged by uh, number of catch and shoots and blocks. And, but no, it's let them be athletes, let them be kids, let them be people once in a while. But yeah, we don't judge anything inside. I mean, you, you don't judge the heart of a player. You're strictly in a box nowadays. Yeah, that bothers me. And to, to watch uh, uh, an NBA player make $45 million a year, to watch uh, an overrated quarterback from Green Bay make $30 ha! million, $30 million <laughs> a year. Um, you know, I, and, and, and baseball players make, that's ridiculous, Jim, um, especially when you've got, and, and that's the other pet peeve, uh, money spent on elections when you've got young people going to bed hungry in this state. Let's talk about the, the high school 
uh, sports, is, which is where the bread and butter yep. of, of local media. As you know. Um, hasn't that changed? I mean, these kids are getting more attention than ever before uh -huh. by the media. They're being held to a higher standard. Is that good or bad? Actually, um, a higher standard is always good that you can hold an athlete to. Um, I struggle with the attention they bring on themselves through social media. Every, um, my son is in the recruiting process right now. He's a long snapper to play at the next level. Um, and and they, everybody wants his Twitter handle. They want, if there's Instagram, and they know every move mm -hmm. he makes. Um, and academically, he's, he's really, really good. They want to know his GPA. They know his standards. They know everything about him before he even arrives on campus for a visit. It's amazing. And I think part of that is, is yes, higher standards, I understand. But they don't have a free moment to themselves. Kids can't be themselves. We expect uh, uh, them to, to work out year-round. Well, remember the three sports stuff where a kid would right. go from football, basketball to baseball, or you wouldn't pick up a ball until it was football or, or basketball. Jimmy, that, that bothers me because, and I see it in my own house, we don't allow them to be kids. And my son was up at five o'clock this morning lifting weights because he knows he's gonna get better because of that. Well, you know what? When do they ever get to sleep in and be the kid, be the young man or young, young woman again? I think we put too much pressure on them. Third thing about you, columnist, sports reporter, but you also like to, you had a regular column feature where you would pretty much point out the things <laughs> that you believed in or could not understand what is going on in the Quad Cities. Well, we have, our streets are still horrible. <laughs> um, how does Moline not have a health inspector? Um, you know, I'll get in trouble because the mayor and I don't, have never seen eye to eye. Um, I, I, street, as I get, um, boy, Oh, the cost of a, of, a, of a meal, the cost of food costs, uh, the hustle of a, uh, you, I know your boys in your newsroom love to go get a Polar Pop uh, at a, a local convenience store. Well, what's it cost? A million dollars, 79? What's it cost them to make that? Right. What's it cost in a, in a restaurant? Um, I would go into a village inn with my son uh, a year ago and, and it'd be $2.79 for a glass of fountain soda with some ice in it for $2.59 and it costs them exactly one cent to make that. Now, I understand you gotta make a profit, but don't do it on my back. So yes, I, those are pet peeves. Is this a career that was worth having? Oh my goodness. Um, a, ego-wise, because I love to have my ego padded, and you understand what it's like to be out in public to have, whether you're getting yelled at, or someone says, thank you for writing that, come on, that's, that's, that's worth whatever uh, financial setbacks we don't, we don't uh, occur. Uh, in our business. But yeah, I, I, do I miss that? Yeah. Great career. Uh, I hope so because I thought I did it right for, for 35 years. It was, it was nice to be able to tell the story. But yeah, you know what it's like to have people come up and, and talk to you and say, hey, uh, this might be a good story or, or thank you for doing this. Yeah, that's worth its weight in gold. That's John Marks who's still penning the columns twice a month for the Quad City Times and the Dispatch Argus. On the air, on the radio, on the web, on your mobile device, and streaming now on your computer. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Wheelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Now providing live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service at their chapel in Rock Island.